Hey guys, for the episode, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the course we are launching again. It is the second iteration, the second cohort of our Everything You Should Have Learned in Chiropractic School But Didn't. And so in the description of the show notes, you will see the link to get on the wait list for the course. The reason why you want to get on the wait list is this. We are going to release a price, an exclusive price only to the wait list, which means that once the course is sort of published, it's the price is going to jump significantly. Ideally, we want to fill the course before we have to release it to the public, and we want you guys to be able to save some money on it. So it makes our life easier. It's going to save you a little bit of money. Everybody wins. We are mo- we are going to start the course November 1st. It's going to be a Tuesday night. The course runs 7 to 9 p.m. Tuesday nights. If you can't make that, I encourage everyone to figure out how to get there live. Again, 7 to 9 p.m. Tuesday nights. The community is amazing. Um, it's going to run for seven weeks straight starting in November. And if you're out there and you can't make the course live, we do have the recording. So you will get access to the recordings, whether you're on there live or not. So there's literally no reason why you should not sign up. So who is the course for? If you're a rehab chiropractor out there, if you're a student that wants to do rehab um, and figure out how to make money doing it, how to crack that business code, world-class clinician and world-class uh, business, this course is perfect for you. So a student, new graduate, associate, people that are getting going on their business journey. And so just to give you an idea of our first cohort, we had 32 uh, attendees on it. And you guys will know very quickly who they are. They are the ones in school that want something different, want something more, are motivated than the rest of the people that want to run a world-class business, that uh, want to practice and treat patients how they want to do it. They want, They don't want to work in a mill. Um, they wanted you rehab, but they're just not okay with not making a living, which I respect the hell out of. Um, at this point, we have proof of concept. So the first group, there was a little bit of faith without results. They just had the trust that we were going to be able to help them. Well, that's not true anymore. We had 32 people and myself and Dr. Jeremy, um, just, we were just shocked, I think with the, the turnout, the results, the feedback that we got. So, um, I'm, so confident that you will get so much value out of the course. It goes through absolutely everything that we've done here to build our three practices, what people like Dr. Jeremy Dinkin have done to help build his practice. And now um, over 50 clinicians that have helped to grow and build their practice. Now this, we have two different programs in the Rehab Cairo Mastermind. This is our starter course, right? It's like a lighter version of our main mastermind because a lot of people in school and new graduates, quite frankly, they don't have the time to dedicate to what we, what we ask of our mastermind members and they don't have the money. And so what we did is we created a course that it's the same concepts but it's just done a little bit lighter, a little bit easier, a little bit slower pace that gives everyone a really strong base for where they are. And so, like I said last time, it was an unbelievable turnout of our last course, which is why we are doing it again. We have a private Facebook group. We have a seven-week course. You have access to Dr. Jeremy and myself. And so, um, as I've joked with people before, but it's true, um, if you do this course, it might change your life. It literally might change your life. It's not going to change my life, but it might change yours. And I don't say that with any sort of um, you know, ill intent. It's true. I genuinely think, and I feel so humbled and honored to be able to tell you out there that if you have any interest in growing a business, if you have any interest in practicing the way you want to practice, if you have uh, an idea that you want to do it differently and you want to grow and scale a business and make a living and provide for yourself and your family and treat patients how they should be treated, then this course is perfect for you. And again, what I'll I'll always say is if you can't afford it, I believe you can't afford not to do it. If you went to school and spent $250,000 on your education and then don't know how to use it um, and make a living doing it, now what? Now what? So I can't tell you enough how much I endorse this, how successful other people have been. If you're out there and you're not sure if it's right for you and you don't trust me or don't trust Jeremy, I actually understand. And so I encourage you to reach out because I will put you in touch with other people, the people that have taken this course. Some of them are in students, some of them are new grads, some of them are new practice owners, and you can talk to them about their experience. Um, and I'll let you talk to them and, and they can sort of share their experience because obviously it's my course. So I think it's great, but I'll let you talk to them because again, uh, if we want to have an opportunity to change this profession and do the right thing here and, um, 
and treat patients the way we know they should be treated, then we got to do something different. And so I hope that message resonates with you. I hope that you choose to, to be with us for our, our next iteration of everything you should have learned in chiropractic school, but didn't. Now for today's episode, we have our favorite guest, and I'll say that about every guest, our favorite guest, Dr. Jeremy Dinkin, who actually, and you mentioned, I mentioned in the podcast, um, had our most downloaded episode ever. So he holds the record. So we're going to see if this episode, he can get it as well. And we are able to talk through the biggest mistakes that we see students and new grads make and going back into our own experience of things that we wish we would have known. We wish we would have known what mindsets, what mistakes did we make, what processes and systems didn't we have. So hopefully here, you know, you can gain some knowledge and insights of like, hey, man, ah, you know, I think that too. And I can learn from people that have made these mistakes already so that I don't have to make them myself. And so we had a... we. We just recorded the episode and we both thought it's better than the first one. So I hope you guys feel the same way. Um, again, just before I go, please find the link of the of the wait list in the uh, show notes here in the description so that you get your name on it because the only people that are going to get the discount will be on that wait list. And I hope that we see you on the course. What's up, everyone? Welcome to the Business School for the Rehab Chiropractor. Class is officially in session. My name is Justin Rabinowitz, and I am a rehab chiropractor on a mission to teach you, a fellow rehab chiropractor, the exact tools and systems I've used to build my own successful rehab chiropractic practice so you can do the same. I hope you enjoy, and please subscribe. All right, we're live. Uh, Jeremy, the man, the myth, the legend, Jeremy Dinkin here. I want you to know that you have a very, very high standard here to uphold to because in the history of the rehab, what's the name of my podcast? I don't even know. Whatever this podcast is called, <laughs> that you have the most downloaded episode in the history in the history of our podcast. And so we'll see how you do round two um, because round one, your close second actually is our boy Natty. So, but you are still number one. So we'll see how this one goes. Mm-hmm. But let's uh, let's see what our standard. The standard is the standard. So let's try to keep you in the top three for both your episodes. If not, you might be cut off, never back again. All right. Anyhow, we have Dr. Jeremy here, obviously a friend of the program, my co-creator of the course, Everything You Should Have Learned in Chiropractic School, but didn't. And that is something we will talk about as the episode goes on. But before we do that, um, we just want to talk a little bit because it's we have an interesting perspective here. We, as Jeremy, he's getting old, man. He's four years out of chiropractic school. I'm 10. And so the nice thing is I think you get unique perspectives from each one of us at different sort of pieces and parts of our career, different seasons of our, of our career. And now getting back connected with people in the rehab chiropractic community, specifically a lot of the students and new grads, it is, it is quite unique because sort of every generation, so to speak, it changes a little bit. Um, so Jeremy, let's get right into it. I asked you before we started to give me, you know, three or four things that you're seeing now because you get so many students shadowing. We have our mentorship group with students and new grads, and there are a lot of things that we're looking at that we see, whether it's a false belief or or something that we just wish we could scream on the top of a rooftop to let every student, rehab chiropractic student know. And the first thing that you talked about was your sales process of what you know now, and specifically, I think the beliefs and thoughts that you had around it. So what just start talking to me about what that what's changed for you even in the last few months and then I'll sort of go back a couple steps so first of all uh I'm very proud of that stat by your podcast so let's try to keep it going um but I think when I came out of school I just like I was saying earlier um I just thought like being a good person was going to get people in the door and keep people there and uh you know that can take you to a certain level. Um, but eventually you get stuck. And I was just the type of person that wanted to get going. Um, I wanted, I was eager to get out of school and start treating people and run my own practice. Um, but again, you get stuck without a system and process. And I thought that a system at the time was overrated. Um, I thought that I can wing it and just keep going and just, you know, I, I felt like I was above, I guess, like having an organized system. 
And so when I got stuck in business, um, I, I realized I had nothing to look back on. I had nothing to look at in terms of where I was messing up or where I had to improve on. And so that was when I realized like, Wow, tracking numbers, KPIs, uh, having a system, a sales process that probably is important. Um, and even though I quote unquote hated business and hated selling, um, I was something that I really needed to dive into if I wanted to grow the practice. Good. So let's let's take each one of those because you just said a lot of really, really good stuff. Let's go specifically into sales, right? Because we know the students, the rehab chiros in practice, one of the first things that I have to basically preach is selling isn't bad. It's not sleazy. It can be done well. It can actually be the most empathetic thing to do with people. And quite frankly, if you want to do rehab and spend time with people and practice the way you want, you don't have a choice. Um, But the one thing you told me before we started recording was the game of opposites. So that's something that we teach in our programs, that game of opposites. So what does that, what does that mean to you? How can you, you know, shed some light on that for a, for a student or a new graduate? So I kind of did this organically without realizing it when I came out of school, just because I had a specific passion for what we do. And um, I also had a hatred for what, normal health care looks like. So I would always compare and contrast kind of what I'm doing in the clinic with people versus what's, you know, common and what people do a lot out there. So for example, um, the quick, the quick sessions, the heat, the stim, um, you kind of use what other people are doing and what your clients have experienced in other offices. And you explain that and, com- and contrast it to what you're doing in the office. And it's just a natural way of selling and it makes it easy. You're not lying. You're just explaining to people what you do and you kind of acknowledge everything that they've done and you just say how you're going to be different so that they can kind of see the value in what you do. Okay. But let me push back a little bit because you were talking about talking to them. But another point you made before we started was show, don't tell. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. So another big one for me in the practice um, in terms of, you know, selling without feeling sleazy is I like to show people what we can do in just one session. So um, we'll go through the, the assessment, we'll do some testing, and then we'll pick some movements that may be painful or the person is fearful of, and then we'll retest that after the session. And typically we get um, incredible results. And not only does that create buy-in, that person starts to kind of trust you and believe in the process. And so you're not, again, you're not really selling, you're literally showing them what you can do in just one session. Now imagine a full plan of care. So now we use the word systems and everybody and their sister wants systems in their practice. Everyone wants a system, right? But it is what we call like a buzzword and that no one knows what that means. Everyone wants a system, but doesn't know which one, how to create it or what the heck it's going to do. But as you're talking about that, I immediately thought systems because that sounds great, Dr. Jeremy. I'm, I'm sure once they get in your office, you can show them but how are they going to get into your office? And that my friends is where the system comes into play. Like it's not so easy as you meet someone on the street and you say, I'm different, come into my office. That's not how it works. And so from your perspective, take it even a step back. Let's say you're doing a a lecture at a gym and it doesn't have to be super detailed. um, But what is the quote unquote system in which you go from meeting someone at a local gym, you do a lecture and then getting them to a place where you can actually show, not tell. Now, that took me uh, a very long time to <laughs> kind of uh, dissect. So um, I think spending as much free time and, and literally free time with somebody um, is going to help gain trust and build that rapport. And then the more time you spend with them, the more time you get to explain and show them what you do. So for example, in our system, um, now we've implemented that the phone call first, um, where you get to talk on the phone with somebody, get to know kind of what's going on with them. Um, it's basically like a, a precursor to the eval. And then even before the eval, there's another step. So now they're coming in hopefully for a discovery session. And again, that's totally free. Um, you're getting to know the person even more. You get to know a little bit more about the history you're doing an assessment, you're doing a movement analysis, 
And now you can kind of get a better understanding of everything that's going on and explain to them why they need your services. And again, so the, that's already two quote unquote free things with them. Um, they're not paying yet. They're not investing yet. And they get to make the decision. And you're just providing them with as much information as possible so that they can make an informed decision on whether to work with you or not. Beautiful. Uh, it sounds like you're listening on the calls because you're saying a lot of stuff that we've talked about, which is, which is awesome. Um, but just a few points to sort of highlight there for people in Cairo school, how many professors tell you, Oh, don't give away your services for free. Again, that's just not understanding business at any capacity at all, because we are in the business of trust. And if we want to have rates and prices at the levels that we do, which is sometimes people are spending two, three, four thousand dollars for care plans with us, which is expensive. It is absolutely an expense. Um, for the most part, again, maybe people out there are better than we are, but I don't believe that meeting someone in a gym and saying, Hey, come on in. Oh, by the way, it's four grand when you show up that with that level of, of trust or, or lack of trust that that's going to happen very much. And so what we do is we build steps in the process because I believe it's, we have empathy to understand that. Yes, it is expensive. And yes, there is a risk and yes, it is different. However, for the right person, this is going to be the best thing for them. And if they trust us, they are going to be much more likely to want to invest in our services and we'll be able to then help them. But without the steps that you were talking about, um, a lot of times that won't happen. And then it turns into and how many students or new grads or 25 years in practice docs will say, yeah, the people in my area are just cheap or they only want to use their insurance. It's like, no, 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 you're just stupid. Right. Um, so uh, I don't really mean that, but kind of, but, but again, I think it goes back it a lot too. to having empathy, right? Having empathy. So that's yep. awesome. Now you mentioned before, when you graduated school, getting into practice, you shadowed someone like me, you shadowed other, other our colleagues and friends that were running a cash-based practice. And the question after that, which I think now looking back, you didn't even know you were thinking that it was just, okay, this looks cool, but now what? You know, and so if you could go back to Jeremy in 10th quarter semester, whatever you guys did over there, what would have been the now what back then? What would you have done? What would you have, what wish, what do you wish you would have known? Wow. That's a good one. Um, I, thank you. <laughs> I think, um, just improving my, um, mindset with money is always one that I refer back to because again, people, and it's still a thing in the mentorship with students that we deal with today. Um, people are afraid to charge the prices that we charge. And I was there too. I totally understand. Um, I feel that from, from actually experiencing it. And it's, it's like, once you get over that hump and you realize that, you know, these processes and, and steps are built in, all these people actually appreciate that they've invested this money, this time with you. Um, like I've said on the podcast prior, a lot of patients end up becoming like good close friends because they've invested in you. They're supporting you. You're helping them get out of pain. You could be literally saving someone's life. Um, you know, we've done it multiple times and seen crazy results. Um, the first patient I ever had, she wasn't able to pick up her kids for a couple of years. And within a couple of sessions, she was back playing with them at the park. Like some, some simple things like that, um, maybe seem simple to us, but like we really have a profound impact on people's lives. And so being able to take a step further, being able to practice how we do and spend the time that we do with patients, we have to charge adequately or else we're never going to have a thriving business and not enough people are going to get our services. So getting into that mindset and shifting out of like, oh, I think, you know, they might think this is too expensive or, um, you know, what are they going to think about this price for the plan of care? I don't know if they're going to be able to afford it. Getting out of that mindset um, would be my number one priority coming out of school because that definitely haunted me for even a couple of years out of school. So here's the problem is that now you have sort of proof of concept, right? You've seen it. You have the stories. You have the case studies. You've seen that happen. But if I'm graduating school or my student clinic, you don't really see a lot of cases or I'm just graduating. I don't have that. So 
how can we help or how can you speak to them or these students or new grads that don't have the experience now that you have to gain that confidence? Well, what, what can we do to sort of fast track that? Because right now it would have to be, unless we have some other mind frame or, or thought frame, it would have to sort of be the faith without results, which sometimes it is just a, hey, you got to trust me on this. But um, mm-hmm. but but is there something else or something other mind frame that we could sort of inject into them before they have those results? Right. Well, that's a great point because um, not everybody is going to be an amazing clinician. And we've seen that in um, other business groups. I've seen it personally. And so being at the top of your game clinically is super important. So that's why I always recommend, you know, doing these extra seminars and continuing ed courses when you're coming out of school, because your clinical skills have to be on par. You can't just provide a shitty product and then charge as high, high price. Like if we're charging Ferrari prices, you better have a Ferrari product. So making sure that like we're, and that's what we teach in the student mentorship is like, we're not just teaching business. We're also going to teach clinical stuff and share clinical stories so that everybody's at a high level clinically. They know, you know, what's going on in the treatment room so that they can charge higher prices. Good. Uh, uh, did you, I can't remember. Did you ever do 30 minute sessions? I did. I okay. did. And, and so I know when, when you yep. started with us, you were doing hours and they were significantly less expensive, um, than they are now, but I, I'm not there yet, but I think I will be soon of like, I want to be the guy with the cardboard meme that says no more 30 minute sessions. Like they don't work type of thing. <laughs> Um, and the reason why I'm thinking about that is because you mentioned the, if you want to offer a Ferrari service type the conversation and the story I've told in the past was the, the biggest transformation we had at our practice strive to move was in 2020 during COVID in New Jersey, which is crazy. We grew 34% that year because we went from 30 minute to an hour. And I think, yes, because it's an hour, we charge more money and we were getting more, um, we more money per customer, but more than that, I think we were able to, I know we were able to offer significantly more value to patients. And so I'm not saying you can't do 30 minute sessions, but again, and I think this is, imagine uh, I started doing 30 minute sessions and how many years did we do that? And so I want to bring this up because if there's a student or, or a new grad out there, um, potentially this is something that if we can just get you to think about a little different, coming out, it could literally change your business from the start of, of what you're, of what you're thinking of doing from a revenue, from a business standpoint. Um, I think one of the issues with, and I'm interested to get your take on it, what I've recognized and have seen time and time again, I, I, uh, I don't know if that's politically correct or not. So if it's not, I, uh, I, um, I apologize. (laughs) I feel like 30 minute sessions are like being half pregnant. And so I think you're kind of stuck in the middle, right? You are giving a better service than the high volume chiropractor spending more time with people, but I don't think potentially it's different enough or high enough to charge the prices that you really do want to be charging. And I could be convinced otherwise, and I'd like to see a practice that does it, but you're more expensive than the cheap option and you're not as pricey, as expensive as the expensive option. And at 30 minute visits, you have to be able to get significantly more volume of patients, which takes more time and money and resources through your marketing efforts. Um, not to right. mention from a clinical standpoint, I just you know, again, you can make it work. I'm not like someone that's going to say you have to spend an hour. You won't get a result. If not, I'm not saying that at all, but there is just obviously with more time, there's more that we can do. There's more value. There's more trust. There's more conversations that can be had to just say, you know what? I really like that guy, Jeremy, you know, because I, I, I spent a lot of time with him and, and yeah, I got to know him and his family and, and, and different things like that. And, And when we talk about doing the opposite, when you go to the other places, of course, that's not going to happen because they got 27 other patients in the other rooms. And so right. um, talk, talk to us about that, you know, when you did 30 minutes or now I know you're strictly an hour, but I think this is an interesting point because so many new grads slash practice owners, they get started at the 30 minute mark because they want to do rehab and potentially they don't know any better. And I didn't either. And again, how I, dude, I think I'd have a Ferrari if I knew this 10 years ago. (laughs) I, uh, I got the question actually pretty recently. It's like, 
they asked if I did half hours and if it was strictly manual therapy and adjustments. And I said, for the people that are grandfathered in, I have a few um, that I do offer still the 30 minutes too, but they're grandfathered in. Like nobody's getting that as an offer. Um, it's, I'm hard pressed to find that like you can do manual therapy adjustments and assessment and coach thoroughly through like some good exercises in 30 minutes. Um, I always feel rushed when I try to squeeze it in. So for those people that are half hour that I still have, it's almost like just manual therapy and maybe one or two exercises. And it's not intensive exercise. Um, for my real sessions, which is what I love to do, it's like, it's almost like strength training towards the end. So there's no possible way that we could fit that in 30 minutes. Um, even just setting up the weights and the exercise selection and all that stuff, it takes some time. And then you're coaching people through it. You're not just doing one set of like five breaths. We're doing like three rounds of 10, 15, whatever it is. So um, spending the time to actually like do the manual, I still do the manual therapy. I do the adjustments, right? I do all the passive stuff in the beginning, but 40 minutes and 30 minutes on is exercise. And unless somebody's coming in and just wants the exercise for the half hour, like then maybe you could squeeze it all in, but that's rare. And so again, providing both gives me the time. I don't feel rushed. Um, and then we get the job done and we do it efficiently. And so the people and the clients get the results they want. I get to cross off all the boxes that I want to do and everybody's happy. Right. Good. And a couple other points there that I want to make from a practical standpoint. Number one, when a patient walks in the door, you know, if you have 30 minutes with them, I, the first couple minutes, ideally you're spending time chatting, right? It's right. not, but if you have 30 minutes and you spend like eight, I'm looking at my watch, like I only got 12, I got to go. Like we got to get going here. Whereas right. when you have more time, you don't have to do that. And on the back end of that, from a clinical standpoint, you know, if we're spending an hour with somebody, we know that one of the hallmarks of being a rehab chiropractor is that most of our clients, they want exercises to do and take home. And so spending the time to be able to go through their homework, show them how to do it, make sure that they're clear. So when they leave your office, you know, at the most, we are typically seeing patients maybe twice a week, unless it's a, a, a acute case. And that's, that's a lot. So there's a lot of time and a lot of quote unquote gains to be made, not in our office. And so five, 10, five, eight minutes on the front end, 10 minutes on the back end, it's, it isn't like you're spending 60 minutes anyway, like doing the thing. It's still probably only 40 and, and then you have a, a good 40. The other part, and this is just very much practical because this is like guys out there learn from us because this, we've done it. We see it. We know it. I, I see so many and you're, and Jeremy, you're, you're in the throes of this right now about to transition out of it. When, if you start your practice, um, and get going with it, and you're the only one there, you, it's, it, there's a lot more that has to happen in that hour than other than just treating a patient. And that's the part that people don't think about, right? Potentially, you've got to look at the schedule, right? You've got to make sure that they're paid up. You've got to make sure that you schedule them on the next time. You have to make sure that they show up. But if they're not there, you have to maybe send them their exercises, aka there's a lot of other tasks, there's a lot of other hats that have to be worn, and we have to make sure that those get done. And so if you're doing a 30-minute right. appointment with people, um, now when does that happen? And inevitably, if it's just you, like it's got to happen sometime. And realistically, right. and again, we have, we're some, we, you and I are motivated people. We get, we're organized with a lot of stuff, but at some point you can only do so many things well if you ha don't have the time. And there are people that push me for, um, to do longer sessions than an hour because of that, even uh, especially on evals, right? Because there's a lot of things that we teach about getting patients to book their appointments and, and pay and all that type of stuff. And so there are people that even want more time so that they can be the doctor and then sort of be the admin all within one session and not feel like you said, rushed to sort of bring someone through. So for those out there that are getting started, haven't started yet about to be start, like just again, take some of these variables and factors in that you might not have considered before. Um, right. And also yeah. people are going to tell you to do the 30 minutes because they think that they're trying to give you good advice. Um, you know, I heard from, you should just do 15 minute sessions, just do 30 minutes, just do the, just do the soft tissue for a little bit. Who cares? It's still money. It's still a patient. And it's like, yeah, but like 
that's not, that's not my model. It's not what I want to do. So you don't have to listen to everybody. Um, people also told me to, that I was never going to make it just doing cash. Um, that I had to do insurance from a variety of people, not just family, um, other clinic owners. They just, you know, you don't have to listen to everybody's advice. And yeah. so if you want to do the one hours like we do, by all means go. And if you want to do the half hours, by all means, but you don't have to do anything. Good. Yeah. And to your point of not only is it what you want to do, um, it, this isn't just a chiropractic thing about building a practice in a way that's going to help your perfect client about being very specific. Because again, we all sort of have it at some point in our life, that scarcity mentality, and sometimes we never lose it. But we always say the riches are in the niches. Um, I've talked to you guys on the call the other day, and I'll share it with the audience. I was, I'm in a business group with non-healthcare related people. One of the guys in our group, Larry, he owns a, like an Asian food company. And in one year, they, he's a distributor, a food distributor. One year, they went from like 350,000 in revenue to a million, ooh, to a million in revenue. Sorry, drop something. He went from 300,000 in revenue to a million in revenue in one year. And I was having dinner with him the other night. And I said, Larry, what, what did you do? And he said, we simplified. He said, we stopped distributing to the mom and pop stores, the smaller accounts. They were the ones that gave us the biggest headaches and we made the least money on them. We were trying to innovate and do all these other products. And we went back to the core of what we did best. And we just started focusing on that. And so growth was in simplification. Almost without fail, one of, and this was Jeremy, this was you as well. Um, the first thing that I do with most people when I start the process with them is get them to have less options. Like it, probably 75% of the time I've done it. Like I go on the websites of clients and I'm like, all right, let's get rid of this. We got three, you know, you got 17 things here. And so what I tell people always is you want to give people a choice, but not too many. It's overwhelming. And so I, I helped a guy the other day, we looked at his options and he had, three 30 minute options and three 60 minute options. So six options. It's like, all right, we got to get rid of half of this. What, where, where are we, where are we getting rid of? Again, we want, want to have options, but, but not too many because it's overwhelming. And again, put yourself in a buying perspective. Like you go to Chipotle, look at like the fast casual, cause they're the people that sort of champion this. Um, you look at Chipotle, you have options, but not too many, you know, you can try these three meats and it's this and it's, and that's it. You know, there's, there's only so much you can do. You still have a choice, but not like 75,000 different ones because simple is often better so long as people still feel like they have a say in the matter. And so I think that that's another really, really interesting point, especially if you haven't started or just getting started, um, that, that can be taken day one into your, into your practice. Um, that's why I have a heart attack when I go to a cheesecake factory. Oh, it's a big menu. Like like 50 pages <laughs> big menu they 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 have got a big menu but uh they also have a yep. big restaurant i mean forget about that not only is it a big menu but you can have, order 40 different pieces of cheesecake yeah what's your what's exactly. your favorite what's your favorite one oreo without a doubt wow that was very fat how many have you had that's the question <laughs> oh true i haven't had that many so the classic um oreo raspberry Hmm. I have to see the menu again. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think a classic is good. If you, I, I'm conflicted on, like, do you think like a chocolate peanut butter, is that actually cheesecake? I mean, it's good, but is it, is it actually cheesecake? I don't think so. No, it's not. It's not. Well, yeah. why what, would you consider Oreo to be cheesecake or is that just cake that happens to have cheesecake flavor? Yeah. See, that's kind of like cheating. I agree. Um, so yeah. So the original, the one that you had at the uh, Italian place was great. Yeah. Hey, guys, that's a little, uh, if you want to come to our mastermind event for no other reason, then we have good desserts there. But <laughs> the problem with that, so the Saturday, I picked the menu. Saturday, I did a fruit plate. Sunday, I went. A little, I said, all right, I'll, I'll give them a little treat here, a dessert. And then as soon as the dessert ended and we went into the next section, half the freaking audience was sleeping. So that ain't happening again. <laughs> I could literally like, <laughs> it was like- your dad. Oh, my dad passed out. I thought, I thought my dad, I went up to him after I said, I think we're in temple for Rosh Hashanah. Cause every year at temple, he falls asleep in the middle of the thing. I mean, I thought that we were in the, I was like, Hey, am I keeping you up for God's sakes? And it was like classic. My yeah, mom makes great. him come to do it. Meanwhile, he's like, I'm passed out halfway through. He wants to be somewhere else, but classic, <laughs> classic. 
Um, I was literally like staring above people's heads as I was lecturing, thinking, m- imagining that I could see their glucose like monitors of, all right, they were at like 185 <laughs> and then they're dropping down to like 80 and everyone just passes out in the middle of the lecture. Yep. Um, <laughs> all right. Anyhow, let's get back on task here. Last thing. So you talked about, you talked about hitting that wall, you talked about hitting that wall. And as I've always said, the first sort of your, your class, I would say of, of mentorship clients or, or mastermind clients that came to me, you guys all sort of start at the same time. And what I found was you all sort of got stuck at the same place where you were in practice somewhere between 18 and like 36 months. You had hustled your ass off to get the thing off the ground. And then you got stuck. And so, as you know, one of my main jobs in in coaching and helping people, and now you are in a similar position, is trying to help people see the next step of like kind of forecast where the problem is going to be before it happens. And so, you know that for all of us, one of the things when we are at zero and just trying to get it off the ground, we can't see past that. And now having the foresight to see the next step potentially we can help people not get stuck at that, like whatever it is, $8,000 to $12,000 mark where you're running out of time and you don't have enough money to grow, which is where most people end up getting stuck as we've seen in this rehab Cairo space. So what is it, what was it that looking back would have prevented you or, or allowed you to get out of that barrier that what, what, what tools did you have to sort of climb that wall? Um, so coming out of school, again, you just want to go, go, go. Um, I wasn't tracking or I wasn't, you know, I was looking at the wrong things. So if you want to just look at patients on the schedule and money in the bank, you're already on the wrong path. Um, and that's what I was doing. So I, I wasn't paying attention to, um, the important stuff, which I had done in the beginning. And then as you get busier and busier, you kind of like slowly let go of those things and you stop doing them. So again, huge mistake. Um, I was like worrying about people on the schedule. I was worried about money in the bank and I stopped doing the tasks that were helping my business grow from the ground up. And so eventually I got stuck and I had to look back on things and I had nothing to look at. It was just like, all right, I saw this many people this month. I made that much this month. Like, where am I going wrong? I had no idea. And so having a structure now and, and KPIs that actually matter, I'm not just looking at financial, I'm not just looking at patients on the calendar. That's actually, I don't even look at those things anymore, really. Well, you do. the other things oh. that actually matter. You do. Yeah. Right. And bit. again, you do. But, and I think this is an important point because, um, you, you, me, none of us are perfect. We're still human. However, what I always say is we're trying to create an awareness because the problem before when you started, when we got started was you didn't even have the awareness of where to look. Now you can almost be like, all right, I'm in that mindset. I'm just looking at the number in the bank. I'm just looking at patient the schedule, but like be disciplined, Jeremy, to go back and say, all right, what are the other metrics here? Right? Because right. we all, I, I heard this actually, uh, a pro golfer was talking about this and he was saying, you know, at any level in, in, in a sport at let's talk golf for a second, like you take lessons, you change your swing, you make a swing change. But when it's pressure situation, there's always a little bit of going back to the bad habit, right? It just happens like that. And really he was saying, it's like, we just want to have the awareness to be able to mitigate it. So it doesn't go fully back. Right. Because those things will always pop up. And so what you're talking about, I think is a good point in that, you know, we preach like the only metrics people pay attention to is amount of patient visits and money in the bank. And if you think about it, that specifically looking at that good or bad doesn't help you take action. And so what we want to be able to do is take a few steps back to what we would call and what we teach is called leading, leading indicators, meaning what are the action steps? What are the things that have to happen first? What are the processes? What are the action steps that have to happen in order to make those lagging indicators, that revenue, those patient visits be, be where they want to be. And if they aren't, 
we can go back and say, all right, like this month we had a bad conversion rate between discovery visit and evaluation. So that's where we actually have to focus rather than just saying we didn't make a lot of money this month. We didn't have enough patience. And so I think that's a really good point because it allows us knowing this, it allows us to be able to go and actually take action. And I think you were one of the first people in the group where we really saw this because you did start tracking. And I remember, right? It was like, oh, you and a classic. Well, I had a bad month. I was like, well, let's look at the numbers, right? Well, what happened? And what we found was that you specifically in that month, you your evaluation to plan of care was was like 25%. And so you had a good amount of leads. You converted almost all of them to a discovery visit. You got, I think, 80 to 90% to an evaluation, but it dropped off a cliff at an, cliff at an evaluation. Jeremy, two years ago, most practitioners for 25 years would just say, I didn't have enough patients. I didn't make enough money. But we could really go in and now dive deep and then practice and figure out sort of where do we go wrong here? And now I think, you know, and again, the thing about being in business that you should embrace is that you have control. Unless you don't have control. You, because you knew your numbers, had control of, hey, I can go and, and, and this is not, not ideal, right? I would rather have all these patients, but at least I know where to go. At least I know where to look. It's not just like random, just going to be anxious because I, I, I'm not making money and I don't know why. Now you actually know why, which is right. uh, which it sounds like that's what you're talking about. Yes. And to defend myself a little bit, um, I used to obsess over um, like how many patients I saw that week, how many patients I saw for the month. And I had, I was tracking that very strongly. And uh, and like I said before, like now I, I'm not as focused, I'll say, at, um, on those specific numbers. It's more of like the check boxes and making sure that I'm doing the right things throughout the week. That doesn't necessarily mean patients on the schedule. Right. And it's very, it's honestly liberating because for years, for two years and a half, I was obsessed with those numbers. And like, I had to get to a certain number for patients for the month and I had to get a certain number for the week. And if I didn't, I was super stressed, right? So now it kind of takes that stress off of you because you know, you're doing the other steps properly and that that's going to help eventually get your numbers up. Good. Yeah. So, um, and then just the last point on that, again, looking at it one step further, because so many people are just trying to get started and then they want to grow to where you are, but now you're in the position where you're about to grow the business. And as I've always preached to you, it's like being a parent, you know, whatever you think or do, right? Your kid's probably going to think or do. And so when you own a business and you're the leader of that business, whatever you think or do is what your team is going to think or do. So if you're oh, we're having a bad month, we only made this much money, then your team is going to feel that too. If you focus on the numbers that we can control and taking action and making sure that we know what the numbers are to be objective about it, it's not you're doing a good or bad job. It's like, here's what the numbers say. It, I think, changes or establishes rather the culture of the business. And, you know, in our company, we have about 12 to 15 people now. And for the most part, outside of when like craziness happens, it's pretty drama free. Because it is a culture that's built on what are the objective measures of the business. And from there, then we can figure out how we think and feel about them. So as I always say, it's like, first, tell me what the numbers say. Then let's talk about what we think and feel about them. Most people are the opposite and that they just think and feel about things that don't actually exist or might not really exist. And then they just live in this world of emotion. And we all know when you get emotional, then you get stupid. All right. Yep. So. We launched our first version, our first iteration of everything you should have learned in chiropractic school, but didn't a few months back, seven week course. And um, to our surprise, it was an amazing turnout. We had over 30 people join in the first cohort of that course. And we have about 20 that stayed with our program to continue on in in a mentorship program. Because of that, um, because of the turnout, we are going to be launching it again. So at a time of this recording, we are going to be a little bit more than a month. We believe the first day of the course will be November 1st. And before that, at the time of the release of this podcast, and you'll get the link, the link will be in the show notes here and I'll announce it in addition and you'll see it on our socials and all of that. We are building a wait list 
for this course. I will tell you right now, the wait list is almost, it's about 30 names already. And we really haven't even advertised it or published it at all. And it's 95% students and new grads that are in the rehab setting that, you know, are people like Jeremy and I, that we were in school. We knew we wanted to practice a little different, but there was nothing out there that was going to show us how and to do business. There was nothing to show us that we could be successful. And there was a way to do what we want to do clinically and, um, and business wise. And so we are going to have another, uh, another course round two of everything you should have learned in chiropractic school, but didn't November 1st. Here's the deal guys. Um, starting Though you will have the link in the chat here, or sorry, in the in the description. We are building the wait list. And the reason why you want to get on the wait list, listen up, you want to get on this wait list is because the wait list will get an exclusive price that we will not be publishing. Once the course goes published live for marketing, the, the price will go up significantly. And so we want you guys to be able to save some money. And if you're interested in saving money and still and being able to take this course, you're going to want to be on our wait list because once we release it, you'll have exclusive access to a discounted price that is going to come and it's going to go. So if you're listening to this and you do want to be a part of this course, um, what I would tell you is the course will be under a thousand dollars. It's, um, it's going to be under a thousand dollars for the people exclusively on this list. And if you can't afford it, guys, what I would say is you can't afford not to do it. Uh, so many of us in the world, in business, um, one of the biggest lessons in business is that you can't go. It just makes sense. You can't go to school and spend $250,000 and not know how to make a living doing it. And I posted on my Instagram the other day, like if you still think and are upset that you didn't learn business in school, then I'm sorry, it ain't going to happen. Right. And so if you want to be around people, you know, the two of us who have been able to have fortunately some success, but more importantly, to be around probably between 30 and 45 other people that are just like you, that want to be like you, that think like you in the build that community aspect, I think that this course is probably perfect uh, for you. Jeremy, give me some feedback from the first time we ran this course. What are some, some, some takeaways that you saw, some breakthroughs that we had from the group? Yeah. So, um, again, I was expecting like eight to 10 people to do it. So awesome turnout, um, a very strong crew, people that joined the student mentorship with us. Um, it's very, very cool to see people taking action while still in school. Um, so I'm, I'm witnessing everybody on social media. Um, people will text me, we'll get on a call. Um, I've done a sales practice call with people. It's just been awesome to see people taking action and taking the steps they need to do so that they can open up their practice right out of the gate. And, and um, so even on top, awesome. even on top of that, Jeremy, um, a lot of the rehab chiros that want, or students that want to be rehab chiros that are in school now kind of do a side job of training. And so a lot of the people in the rehab chiro mentorship, they're taking the principles that we are teaching and they're applying it now in their, while they're, you know, assessment of clients or their training of clients or trying to acquire clients. And so it's not like they're just taking the course and just waiting until they open their practice. So many of them are utilizing it like today, tomorrow, taking the same principles, which I find, you know, again, an added benefit that I didn't really consider, but you know, you and I both know most of them are, are doing something on the side as well in that capacity and, and the skills do translate. Yep. It's been really cool to see that. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm proud of the group that came first. They took a risk. They didn't know what we were going to teach, but they knew that they were frustrated. And now just watching them, you know, implement everything has been really cool to watch. Yeah. And they, you know, it's cool, like you were saying, because they built their own little community, you know, from New York to LA to Dallas to Florida, there's, there's Cairo students that they didn't know each other before, but you know, it, it's it becomes very evident sort of who your people are and they meet by themselves. They do trainings by themselves. We have a private Facebook group that they're all um, a part of now. And, you know, as I've found and have you found a lot of times, you know, as you sort of grow in your life and business, you meet people that have similar um, to wants and, and desires that you do. And those are the people you connect with. And, 
if nothing else, the course allows you to to connect with these type of people. You know, in my own experience, my own groups, I've met some of my best friends there because we think the same, we have the same values, we have the same desires. And it's been such a great, great, great experience. On top of that, we believe the content. We, and again, we genuinely believe this. I don't know. If I, I, I believe it to be true. I know you do as well. No one else is doing this, right? And the piece of this 100%. that I think at a, at a very tactical level, guys out there, if, if you're sort of wondering what the thing is, just as I observe the chiropractic industry, there's obviously business coaching out there for like high volume practices. We know that if you're listening to this podcast, that's not you. You're not going to do well there. Even within the other business space, PT, chiro space, what I've seen is that Nobody is really has cracked the code on how to be able to communicate and quote sell in a high ticket item, high price point, high value. Because most chiros out there that are evidence based are still doing, you know, 15 minute appointments, four patients an hour. And if they're, if they're doing okay, they're charging 70 to 80 to $90. But I can tell you if you're out there and you think you're going to graduate and want to charge 195, 200, 225, or two, 295, 300, like we are, it requires a different skill set. And that is for me, gun to my head. What I think the main thing that we sort of preach and go over is how to do that in a non sleazy, non pressurized way. That's going to open up your eyes in a world to being able to have a business that you're proud of, that you treat patients that you want to treat, and that you can grow and scale over time so that you can have the business and life that you want. Exactly, and remember that the more of us that are that are out there, the more people we can help. And so if it's if you're never going to grow your business, what's you're only going to help a local community? Like I feel like we're making a good impact around these states. I I think and the next point too, Jeremy is, and I preach this to you guys. I believe my job and and subsequently now your job is the only way that we sort of change this profession as a whole is that we have really strong businesses so that we have the profit, we have the money, we have the resources to be able to go and hire associates and new grads and bring them into a really good setting where they can learn and grow and make a fair wage and make a living. Right now, Rehab Kairos, the reason why you guys out there, there's no jobs for you is because nobody's been successful enough in business to be able to hire you. Well, how are we going to change that? I promise you, if you're out there and you're doing an hour session or 30 minute session at $125 a session, listen, I promise you, you are going to be a statistic. You're going to be the one that can't hire, that is going to eat their young because you can't afford them. And so long term, I've always said my mission is to help other rehab chiros grow themselves in their business so that one day, a few years from now, you know, we can have a student from Parker. Hey, hey, do you have any associateships that are open in in Florida or in California or New Jersey? And yeah, we got a bunch of our rehab chiros here that have wonderful businesses that can pay a fair wage. You're going to learn a ton. You're going to have to work your ass off, but we have those right now. They don't exist. And so at a higher level, I believe that's one of the things that we have to do because from a business perspective, we have to level up if we want to make a dent in this profession as a, as a group. So again, if you're out there as a student, it ain't just going to happen. And you, and again, I don't want to be here 20 years from now, like, Oh, all the, uh, all everyone's just high volume. And that's the only guys that make it. Yeah. No shit. Because they're that ones that actually have a good business and we don't. And so exactly. I hope that motivates you because it's not just going to happen. It ain't just going to happen. Just like you didn't just learn to be a good clinician by learning what they taught in school. You did outside resources, you study, you invested money. And so if you want a good business, you're going to have to invest somewhere. You're going to have to invest somewhere. Or you can wait until you get stuck or or can't pay your bills and then you'll figure it out. I would rather do it now. Exactly. All right. So well said. Friday morning, thank you. Um, you have patience to treat. I have videos to make. So this is a, a good ending. Any final closing thoughts? Um, I think that last point that you said, like if we all don't run efficient businesses, we're never going to be able to hire the people that we want and we're never going to push this profession in the right direction. So um, if you hate money that much, like you always say, uh, we'll take it and, uh, <laughs> or just save it so that when you do hire, you know, somebody who's in your position now, later down the road, you can afford them. And you can pay them right instead of being offered shitty contracts we were offered. Beautiful. Jeremy, 
Appreciate you. We'll see how the stats do on this. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. And if you found this content valuable, here are four ways I can help you for free. One, grab a copy of my free guide, The Rehab Chiropractor's Checklist. You can get that at go.drjustinrabinowitz.com slash guide. That's go.drjustinrabinowitz.com slash guide. Two, go ahead and give me a follow on Instagram at Justin Rabinowitz, where I post business content. Three, subscribe to my weekly newsletter by sending me an email at coaching at strive to move.com. And four, leave us a five star review so we can gain access to more influential people and bring those lessons back to you. Thank you.